We're going to have something a bit different today. I want you guys to, when I come back, I want you guys to uh, get ready to be, to have your story ready. Tonight, I'm going to ask you guys some things about what the Lord has given you because we're going to publish a report from you guys. I'm going to put it in a very uh, notable place. So don't make anything up, right? Don't, Don't make anything up. We're going to hammer out some things tonight. But but this time, I want to know from you guys what the Lord has given you. And then we're going to have help compiling it. All right? So no one make anything up. I'll be back in just a few minutes right here at COT. Good evening, everybody out there. Good evening. Let's start right there. Okay, it's Friday. I'm going to do something a bit different tonight. Uh, Can it, Liam, because of what we face? Now, you guys know most most of the uh, forecasting uh, people have been doing, right? Doesn't quite pan out. They can tell you when a flood's happening about a couple of hours before it ever hits. But forecasting is very difficult. I've found in my own life that uh, when I give information about weather, information about incoming objects, information about geological happenings those come from three sources one i trust the other two i do not trust one trust is from data points right lots and lots of data points for example this year all the data points that were collected yielded some pretty high temps that we're going to have to face this year right data points and modeling those models kicked out numbers that were probably around 140 degrees now although there were heat index numbers that were around that ambient temperatures have been around average uh, a little above average about 115 degrees that's all not not too bad right by no means the hottest temperatures we felt on this planet thus far of course, August is coming, and that could absolutely flip. But these are from data points in modeling. Now, for the most part, this modeling is uh, close. It's very close. It's not the Weather Channel's modeling. Uh, modeling. They have been so far off. Uh, it's just been uh, somewhat astounding, but they've been off quite a bit. So they need to make some adjustments to their modeling. And, of course, you guys, just in case you don't know, uh, when it comes to computer modeling, and um, artificial intelligence, I somewhat excel in some of those uh, areas. But computer modeling gives a general idea of what could take place, right? But I don't trust computer modeling that much, right? That's the first source. The second source is from direct um, um, observation. When you see what's happening in space, because you have access to things, access that's given to you for whatever reason, you tend to draw conclusions. And when you see the data points, you put all this together and all of a sudden, you know, you see certain things, but man, sometimes that can be very tricky. And still again, it's modeling. Spiritually, there has never been a time when it failed. Spiritually, there has never been a time when any type of spiritual indication of something was a failure. There has never been a time that the Lord actually gave me something that did not take place. There's never been a time that happened. All the other ways, they tend to fail a lot. They can come close, but they don't quite hit the mark spiritually. It never, ever fails, right? Now, I know I'm not the only one that the Lord gives things to. The average person, I would say, the average Christian, the Lord may give you, well, before I say that, I trust in spiritual things. But do you not know, God has given warning of things all throughout the history of the Bible to his people. He's selected prophets, yes, but he did not leave the rest of the people out. Let me give you an example of something. Any great major event that took place in the earth, right? The Lord has warned about. He already warned about it. 
right? Any any great major major thing that happened in the earth, God gave warning about. Um, for example, take for example the flood. The flood's a pretty big deal, right? The flood is a big deal. So the flood that destroyed a lot of life on this planet. God would have given warning to quite a few people. And the more archaeology we collect, the more people find out that people all across the globe were having the exact same dreams. All across the globe. People were having dreams of trees flying in the air. Animals um, not making a sound but flying in the air. Debris flying in the air. This was their dreams. Um, they would see this, and it, they were having it night after night after night somewhere. Well, as it turns out, this was a look. If you think about something, all these dreams with animals in the air, all types of animals and trees and debris, and the animals were, were, were moving along with the fish in distress. People, tons of people flying in the air. And before... There were some interpretations where these philosophers would think it was, uh, you know, uh, something to do with uh, change in people or something like that. But for the most part, God showed them exactly what was going to happen. If you were to drown in water and everything, uh, water covered up everything, right? You see animals over your head. You see trees suspended over your head, uprooted, right? By water floating in the water. That's precisely what they saw precisely what they saw a bunch of animals debris and everything else you know that's that's um that's documented not only in archaeology but in the book of enoch that's documented uh as per these dreams people were having that they didn't understand somebody says that uh let me see let me fix something here what about now guys you you guys get to go Ooh, i'm way up there now i'm right there at the line i can't go too much because i'm a big mouth and if i'm happen to go too high it's going to blow your eardrums off but God gave people indications of things years before it ever happened I believe in Enoch's case it was about um, it, it was a big event God gave ample time 40 years about 40 years 40 to 50 years time before this ever took place now I want to ask you guys something because I believe that God never stopped doing that he never stopped oh by the way when Christ came right when Jesus came, um, Jesus, before he came, counterfeits came, saying that they were the Messiah. People began to have dreams of a kingdom that was coming to earth. They began to have dreams all over the place of a kingdom that was coming to earth. There were some people, just, just as people do in this day and age, we document things, right? They did so back then, too. They documented things, and they documented people's dreams. The, a lot of people saw judgment coming. They did. They saw judgment coming, but for the most part, they saw bondage breaking, miraculous healings, and for the most part, they saw mus the Messiah coming, a kingdom coming, a different rule coming. They saw their enemies toppled and everything else. And we know that this was the entry of the kingdom of God through Christ Jesus. Right, And the sacrifices they saw. Many people had dreams of sacrifices. And it was said that at the time, the Pharisees at the time thought this was a message from God to make sure that all sacrifices were paid attention to. Consequently, that's exactly what they did. Right? But we know that Jesus was that sacrifice. So as you can see throughout history, God's given warning before he ever did anything just about to anybody who would listen. So I believe that if anything major happens in this world, if we're about to undergo anything major, the Lord will have already shown you and prepared you for what's about to come, which means there are things that God has given you. You may be keeping to yourself, but I can almost guarantee they complement something that somebody else has. It requires a person to be honest, right? You can't change anything. You can't, if it's silly to you, then let it be silly. Let it be silly. Don't alter anything. But I, I truly, and, and I honestly believe that the Lord has given his body a message of truth. 
Now, what we do with that truth, I don't know. And it always takes one of uh, the principles of Christ to bring that truth forward. See, the Lord bonds us in love, and by love we are to walk. He even said, he even said, uh, uh, you know, people will know that you're my disciples by how you love one another. So we know that love is is one of those principles the Lord gives. That if we don't exercise it, we're going to be kept separate. And if we're kept separate, the Lord giving us things in part, we're never going to have a whole picture of what's to come, right? We have the Bible, yes. But I believe that God has given people bits and pieces of, of, of something that when the body of Christ is together, when they begin to reason with one another, right? A greater truth comes forward. I honestly believe that. I've seen that work on a small scale among groups that um, I'm with. A bunch of uh, guys, we get together, and sometimes we get together just to share what the Lord has given us, and it is amazing what comes out the other end. It is amazing. When when people are, we know when somebody's not honest because it doesn't match anything. And, and no matter how silly you saw something in a dream, no matter how silly it seemed, if a person does not alter what the Lord has given them, it's going to compliment a truth he gave somebody else. And collectively, you're going to have a complete picture of what's coming. In this day and age, there are fears. People have real fears about things. Real fears, right? And with those fears, a lot of people, they don't want to look at what they've seen. I'll be the first to tell you guys, I'm, you know, for a long time. Throughout my life, I'm plagued with dreams I, to the point of losing sleep and everything else, right? But I'm used to it now. And I used to think that most people were like that, that they would have dreams and then they would uh, see these things come to pass and they wouldn't have power to change it or anything else. I, I honestly thought everybody did that. That's the way the world was, right? I was wrong. But I found out painfully that's not the way people are. Um I just kind of kept my mouth shut for many years, but it was still a plague because, uh, for example, for example, if I shut my eyes and go to sleep, when I go to sleep, the latest one was, and I'm going to just give you guys an example because you'll see it. You ready? It was this, it was this guy who was a, it's very distasteful, but this is an example of what the Lord gives me. There was this guy who by day, he's a very ordered person. He's a very ordered person. But he drinks at night, right? He drinks at night. When he drinks at night, something else starts taking over. It's a. It looks like a blue pig is what it looks like. But the blue pig has designs all over it, kind of like that old iconography that you see on, um, uh, I don't know, in some of these, some of these um, places like um, India or something like that. It looks exactly like those things, with the blue skin and the designs in the face and everything, except those designs are silver hairs that come out. And anyway, this thing takes over this guy when he begins to drink. And this guy has an obsession with a little girl, right? I even know the little girl's name. I know the guy's name. I know the guy's name. I know the little girl's name. I know the name of the church. I know the area they were in. And I know the, the uh, place where this act will be committed anyway. This guy was just totally obsessed. And as he's coming off his drunkenness, when people are trying to stop him, they're trying to stop this guy, right? But they stop him this way, like, oh, here he is. He's doing it again. He's a pretty strong fellow, influential fellow. But they try to stop him, but nobody says a word. This girl, who is a subject of his, he, he, she's a subject of his um, possession or whatever you want to call it is so torn and ripped inside all she wants to do is escape into her it's like a living nightmare every single time this guy drinks this happens every wednesday night right you guys will likely hear about this story i'm not doing this to brag or anything i'm going to just give you an example of when the lord gives you something take it seriously right meditate upon it match it with the word of god don't stop discounting things. We know when we have a foolish dream and we know when we don't. A, a, a dream that the Lord gives you is not something you want to dream about. It's not something you want to see. It's not, it's not any of those things. And um, I'm telling you right now, when, when God gives you something, sometimes they hurt. 
really bad, right? Sometimes they're against, uh, you just, they make you sick when you come out of that dream. That's just the way it works. But this girl lives a nightmare. She's young. She's a very young girl. She lives a nightmare. And her world is not like ours. Her world is filled with nothing but ideas of escape. She's too young to make it on her own, too frightened to run away. And she's hoping and praying that every single time this happens, that maybe he'll go get someone else. That's in her mind, right? It's in her mind. Um, now, I'm giving you this example because, frankly, I'm allowed to. And when you see this story, well, then you know that God does not give gibberish. He doesn't give gibberish. It just requires us to keep those things he gives us. They will be of use to somebody. One time I described a dream like that, law enforcement. I can't name who it is because that, would, that wouldn't look good on their record. But um, they also pay attention to people's dreams and what people say. And when they have an incident, uh, you know, these things actually happen. Things have been, uh, things have been, uh, well, certain crimes didn't happen because of this too. They didn't, right? Which means the Lord doesn't give us useless things. But he put us here for somebody else. You are here for somebody else. You may not know who that is, but you're here for somebody else. Once you give your life to Christ, you enter into um, a, a type of self-identification. Then you go into servitude. You exist for somebody else. But the Lord gives us things. And if we never go deeper into his word, we'll never have trust enough to begin to discern what's of him and what is not. Right? And I'm telling you now, these spiritual things, as I said in the beginning, these the spiritual things God gives, they don't ever fail. Modeling fails. Data points fail. Forecasting from data points, it fails. What the Lord gives, it never fails. It never does. I sneak things out ever so often here, right? Ever so often for a reason. And but it's it's strange that when they come to pass. Um, nobody knows where I got it from. That's, that's the funny part. But I'll tell you right now, you have things in you that will most certainly come to pass because how many times has the Lord given you something? You didn't say a word about it. The Lord gave you something. You didn't tell us all. You didn't talk about it because you thought it was too outlandish, crazy. You didn't give it any credence or it had no value at the moment, but you remembered it. And then all of a sudden, days later, it took place. Days later, it took place. And you don't know what to do when the Lord gives you something like that, right? You have no idea what to do. That's partially, that's where collective prayer comes into play. And that's where a plea for instruction comes into play. And it really requires that people begin to really look at the other people beside them and make a decision that they're going to love their neighbor or not, right? When I say love their neighbor, I mean wholeheartedly putting aside all this other nonsense, all areas of division that we may have, and it's all these offenses, all accusations and everything, and for, for the truth of Jesus Christ, which is he has come to save our souls, we're not going to be in this state when we're with him. We're going to be washed of our sins. We're going to be family anyway. Some of you can establish that now. But there are folks out there who would just love to benefit from the body of Christ. There are entire peoples out there. You guys remember when I told you, uh, I was telling you guys, and it kind of bothered me about that dream I had when all of a sudden the city fell. There was I was in some city and it started falling and people were running all over the place. You guys remember that? And I, you know, somebody asked me, well, what caused it? I said, I don't know, but the city began to crumble. Um, and it was like, you know, people just had, they had no warning. They had to get up and go, right? Do you guys also remember that right after that? Um, and I even knew about the Ukraine war, but funny enough, here, here's the funny part. Before the Ukraine war started, um, that dream was bothering me, but I never put the two together. I never did. Never put the two together. I didn't put the two together. I knew Putin was going to go into Russia because I couldn't deny that. Or, or to the Ukraine, I couldn't deny that. But as far as the cities, right, 
in, in what happened in those cities and to the people. That part, because people were trying to get out of the city, and I believe it's um, Flash, is it on archives? I'd be careful about this too, because I'm getting older. Sometimes things, one thing will run into the other. But um, I never put that those two together. I remember when they were doing the evacuations, and they were actually fighting each other to get on the trains in the Ukraine. They were. They, they were hostilities uh, from the people in the Ukraine trying to position themselves to get out. And so I never put those two together. I never did, right? Just never did that. But But even in that... You know, God gives a warning. How many of you have had a dream about water? And how many times have you guys heard somebody in the body of Christ say, you know, I've, I've heard about these floods. I saw water coming up just out of the blue. I believe that began in 2007. Out of the blue, people began to talk about water. Now, this was during a time when uh, everybody was looking towards government, trying to discern what was happening while the Lord was giving something else. The Lord was warning people about water. I, I heard even me, I had a dream where I was looking down at, at a sidewalk and some muddy water came down the sidewalk and it began to build. And as I followed the water looking up, I saw half the sky and I thought it was a storm coming, but it was a tsunami. It was a tsunami that was coming. So many people had dreams of tsunami, tsunamis on the East Coast of all places, right? And a lot of rain, just, just this rain. Um, I've had dreams about fog, just this perpetual fog. And in that fog, there were conditions. People were doing any and everything they wanted to do. There was lawlessness. Uh, people had totally degraded morally. That should also be on record here at COT. And it, as it turns out, here we are, right? Lots of people have been, their homes are destroyed over the last, what, uh, five years from floods. It's been a lot of money spent from floods. I'm, we're talking about all over the earth from floods. Had we paid attention back in 2007 about the floods and did something about it, if we trusted the Lord enough to begin to listen to one another and to say, wait a minute, why is everybody having dreams of water, right? Of, of floods, of all this mud and stuff like that. Why? why? And if we put that together, we could have made preparations for other people, for ourselves, right? In all honesty, for ourselves and other people. And we could have mitigated some of the stuff that's happening right now and will happen going into the future. We could have. We could have. But the issue was, there's still this element of division we have to deal with. There's this element of ego and pride we have to deal with. And if we could somehow push all that aside, right? And really focus on the Messiah and be true to those things he gives us, right? Not, not to be a false witness, which is a, a false witness can be a few things, but one way to be a false witness is when the Lord gives you one thing, but you alter it to make it sound a lot better, right? More believable to try and get your point across that, as false witnessing, because it's by no means exactly what the Lord gave you. If he showed you an orange pig running on top of a tree branch and then the pig flew away, then tell it if you believe that was from the Lord, right? Then, then document it just like that. Don't change anything. Don't change. Don't say the sun was so bright. It made the pig look pink because if you start altering things, you defeat the entire purpose, right? But I'll tell you, if you keep the integrity of what the Lord shows you, if he can trust you with that, he'll add to them. That's another one of his principles folks, if the Lord can trust you because he will try you so that you know what you're about to do with what you get, if he can trust you in these small things, he'll add to it. If he cannot trust you in the small things, the Bible says, don't think that person ought to receive anything else. So if we can be trusted in these small insignificant matters, the Lord is not going to add to us anything, right? Because we certainly won't be able to take care of the bigger matters. And that's something all of us have to really uh, put forth an effort to do, to make sure that we keep pure all those things the Lord gives us, never to use it for our own advantage. I used to hear people say that for the, I used to hear people say this a lot. They would say, well, the Lord told me to tell you that what you've got to do is you've got to calm down. Oh, come on. It, you no. Know. And then you can discern, you know, because your spirit rises up when, when um, somebody's trying to interject authority over person using God to do it, 
That's exactly what God said people would do, especially in these end days, utilizing his scriptures, utilizing his word to get their own agenda across. God said they would do this over and over again to the point where people would not really trust the word of another. God said they would do this, right? But if we would keep the integrity of what the Lord gives us, my goodness, we'd have it there. Many of you probably had dreams of water. You did. Many of you likely. How many of you have had dreams of snow, of, of something, uh, of struggle in the snow? How many? Anybody? Somebody said, I had a recent vision in prayer about your pan snapshot in time water. Oh, yeah, yeah. But how many had a dream of snow at all? Of, of specifically this, of, of it snowing, but you had to survive the snow. In other words, it, it became spiritually challenging in the snow. I've had that about five times so far. That in the dead of winter, when nobody could absolutely run away, right? People had to spiritually survive in the winter. In the winter. They had to survive in the winter. So, But it was a spiritual survival. It's not that they didn't have food. And I remember me telling another brother that was in this, I, I said, hang on, hang on, hang on. It, it, it was really rough. It was really dark in the wintertime. It was like things began to go wrong in the wintertime. And I took a child and I began to, we started running. I, I found, we start running out of this house, this small patch of grass. And when we got to the green grass, right? We let the, the kid go because this young child couldn't fend for himself. We got to this green patch of grass, this little, in the dead of winter, this green patch of grass. And we knew somehow getting to that point was a lifesaver. But I look back at the landscape. The landscape was desolate. There was nothing around. It looked like a desert. Whatever happened wiped away everything. I think I told this to you guys a couple of uh, year ago. I think it was that winter came and when winter left, when it began to thaw, nothing was left. It was dirt. It, it looked like a primordial world. There, there was nothing left. When the snow melted, there was nothing left. So something of magnitude happened uh, with the snow, right? Anyway, it's time to get, I'm saying all this to let you know this. There are people out there that need what the Lord has given you. It's going to take a group of folks who really love the Lord and love each other to begin to intake some of these things and not discount them, right? Not discount them, not skip over them, but to actually analyze and read them and somehow, right? Pray about it, fast about it, but take what the Lord gives everybody seriously in this time. I can assure you that most people are going to do the opposite. The world's going to do the opposite. They're not going to come closer together, taking seriously those things the Lord has given others. Right? They will split apart and find reason to hate each other more and more. We already know that's coming. We know the tipping point, what people call the tipping point, is coming. We know lots are going to reach the boiling point. If, if one more thing happens in this country, people are going to boil over. How do I know this? Because you've got at least, at least, I would say at least a little under half of America armed and ready to take power. You guys may not know this. But that's just the way it is. You have these groups in Europe that have been forming all this time. And since Merkel is gone, these guys have nothing to hold them back, and they're ready to take power. They believe that their governments are in direct betrayal of their value system. They're going to take it back. Now, that, would, that seems outlandish, right? But why in the world are state troopers stopping tractor trailers full of arms? Why are, why are state troopers, local police, special agencies why are they hunting down shipments of weapons going to militias that have just formed why is the circulation of messages starting to repeat each other high-end coordination is taking place on many different levels and we're not talking about some ragtag group of uh, people who formed a militia who don't know how to fire you know a weapon or something that's not what we're talking we're talking about folks who are trained they're trained in arms, right? A lot of these guys are, are trained in combat arms, special tactics. Um, they are coordinating. They believe that our government is gone. 
they do not, they do not, I repeat, they do not recognize what's in place now as, as legitimate government. They're ready to do something about it. Now, you have a big portion of America, Europe, and, and, and even in the UK who are oblivious to these things. Nevertheless, they're still going to take place because these people, these folks are getting themselves ready to make a move. They will make a move. You guys know how rumors start. You know that if a rumor starts, it only takes a couple of notable people to believe in them. And, and when that takes place, it gains ground. And when you have a group of people believing in this, in, in the same rumor, the person who began the rumor can come back and say it wasn't true. It's too late. Once it catches fire, people legitimize what they hear. If it serves their agenda, they will legitimize whatever they hear. They will keep it. They will make it true, and they will act on it. And, folks, we are very tip. We're, we're talking about eggshells. Eggshells are all over the place. There are events. They will most certainly pull the trigger on these events. It's going to be, you know, people are going to say enough is enough. They will. They will. COVID did not do it, but it certainly initialized. It initialized half of it. And, um, you know, when the Lord showed me about those people dying, he showed me something else. I, I don't want to, I'm, I'm just not going to say it. I, I won't say it. I, I won't say it because if I, if somebody says something like that, it gets into the minds of other people and I need counsel before I say anything about that. But all those people dying in China, that's where it began. Then it came over here like brown fingers, right? You guys are witnesses to that little story and to that little thing. And again, I'm not, listen, I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm telling you something here. I'm telling you that likely what the Lord has given you is far more important than what the Lord has ever given me. I'm also telling you that many of you have held things back because of ridicule and everything else. I'm also, I, I'm trying to convey to you, there is a way. Right? There is a way that we can absolutely incorporate what the Lord has given you to help people out without them ever pointing a finger at you. If the Lord gave a person something, right, then it's no longer that person's something. It is help from our Father. That's what it is. Help from our Father to prepare. Why would the Lord want us to prepare the same way he gives us signs for seasons? When you see signs for winter, you don't go out and buy a bunch of summer clothes, do you? No, you prepare for the season coming. The Lord will allow us to know the season we're in. In fact, it was said that we better know the season we're in. If we're serious about our salvation, we might want to get serious about the seasons we're in. The only way to do that is to wholly accept God's word, to accept his truth and to trust his method. And we got to face ourselves on that. We have to ask ourselves, do we trust the methods of our Lord or not? Because there's, there's uh, people, you'll see them turning on each other. You're going to see it. You're not going to believe it. I saw a Christian in my own head somehow. I saw a Christian stand powerless as they looked at the person they loved and that person had zero love for them. It was like that person turned into someone else. They had zero love for them. They accused them and ultimately turned them in. They found a fence to get award money. That's what they did. They wanted to get award money. People started turning everybody in. I looked at the leadership and it was not like it is right now. It was different. Things are forming fast. The Lord has given us warning. Now we have to be responsible and do something with it. Not for gain. Not to be famous. Right? But if we believe in the Lord's methods, then let us believe all the way. We have to pray about it. It's going to take some uh, collective praying under the instruction of the Lord. Not something we do ourselves and just get together and try to make something happen. No. Instruction from the Lord is good. 
He coordinates things that we can't coordinate. He does it all the time. Last week with a group of guys, I was kind of sick last week. So here's how that worked. I walked into this place and come to find out there were about there were about 102 more that walked into that same place at the same time with the same thing on their mind. Now, you know, that's the Lord. That's not me. That wasn't them. That was the Lord. And if we yield to these things, if we get in the habit of yielding to these things, you'll find that God has coordinated so much in a way that 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 just supersedes all this stuff that we do. If we can only trust him a bit more, take another step in your faith and trust of the Lord. Don't test him. Commit yourself to him. Never test him. Commit yourself to him. In other words, wherever you're at right now, right? You take another step of faith by saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to believe you even more now. Even more. Be responsible with it. Don't go to your housetop and start yelling out every dream or vision you have. Don't do that. Right? The first thing to do is keep those things he's given you. How do you keep something God has given you? If you're serious about keeping something, you will document it. If you're serious, if you anticipate the Lord giving you something, you're going to make preparations for it, won't you? Right? Won't you make preparations? Won't you have a notepad beside your bed and a pen? Won't you? And instead of rolling over after you see the thing, won't you get up in the middle of the night when you're too tired to get up in the middle of the night and document it? If it's important, you're going to document it. You know what that is? Those are movements initialized by your faith only. With the Lord, don't operate by proof. Always operate by your faith in the Lord, which means believe his word, make preparations for anything you ask for. It's just like praying. How many of you have prayed for something and you just went to sleep? Said, I don't know if the Lord's going to do it or not. That's not the way to, I'll tell you right now boldly, don't pray like that. Please don't pray like that. I, you know, I made a bold statement before and it's true and I'll stand by it. I have, I don't, I don't, I, I don't have vain prayers. In other words, if I pray for something, the Lord delivers. So let me give you an example. First of all, do I ever pray for me? No, I do not. All my prayers are purposed. I will not haphazardly pray. I will give him thanks all day, but I will not haphazardly pray. Second, because God does everything with purpose, then everything I have must serve a purpose. And it must be for the kingdom. Now, for something to be for the kingdom, it must be for you. You're never going to be disconnected from the kingdom. That's number two. Okay, number three, when I do pray for something, I make preparations to receive it. I make room for it right away. I've had people ask me some, what are you doing? I'm making preparations for something to come. Well, what's coming? Well, this is. Well, did you find one? No, but it's coming. So I got to make preparations. I mean, I go overboard. But guess what? It does come. It comes that way. And it, not, I, I, it just comes that way. That's the way it works. If you make preparations. Now, that's because I really believe that if I ask the Lord for something, right? I've already qualified my prayer by following the principles of Christ. Jesus said, he'll give you the desires of your heart. He said that, right? But this is only after. This is only after you have a desire change. He's not going to give anybody the desires of their hearts if those desires are rooted in selfishness, in ego and pride, in thievery, fornication, or any of those things. He's not going to give that to you. He's not going to give you a get out of jail free card if he has you in the middle of a trial. That's what's meant by allowing the Lord to raise you. He's in control of your life. He's raising you. He's going to take you through valleys. He's going to take you on roads and highways and byways. He's going to take you through ups and downs. So let him take you and learn, maximize. Don't fight him in those things. Most people, when something happens that they don't want to happen, they instantly rebuke it. The Lord is the one that takes you into the trial. You'll, you'll not go into a trial unless Christ be with you. Because if he weren't with you, you would be destroyed. He's going to be with you. He's talking to you. He's teaching you. He, we all know what a trial really does, don't we? It brings out that part of us we've convinced everybody else we don't have, doesn't it? It brings out that, that ugly part of us. It brings out the devious part of us to try and get out of the issue or the trouble. We start thinking about crazy things. 
And it brings that out. Now, why would the Lord bring that out? Here it is. Before you go through a trial, you could swear in a court of law and pass a lie detector and say, I don't have that problem. You'd actually believe it. When that trial comes, it causes things to surface. You may have really thought you, you could easily overcome but then during that trial it comes to the surface why would it god ever bring something like that to the surface so that he can uproot it every time you go through a trial you're cleansed in a specific way you may be a lot of people come out of a trial they're worn out i don't want to go back through that anymore oh my god but you're not the same person that you were going into it no matter what it is it cleans you up. You know how when you when you have a pot, if you had a pot or a pan, right? It's got food crust all over it. Well, sometimes you have to give it some elbow grease for that stuff to come off, correct? That's a trial. The process of cleaning somebody up, sometimes you hit these rough spots, these persistent things that you have to really scrape off. And if your trial is rough, something is being removed that should not be there. It's causing you to be dirty. The Lord doesn't advertise this to the world. There are a lot of times you're going to go through a trial that will be embarrassing. It's going to be embarrassing because, number one, you shouldn't have that thing in the first place. Number two, it's only embarrassing because often we claim we're standing one way, but in real life, we're, we're, we're not standing that way. It becomes embarrassing when the truth is found out. When somebody else can see, oh, that person is not that strong. That person is not that wise. That person is not that clever. This, that, and the other. We get all embarrassed because we're trying to cause other people to see us how we want them to see us. And when the Lord shows the truth, we get embarrassed we shouldn't. Because here's the beauty of somebody knowing a weakness in you. When they see a weakness in you, right, they know you're no good in a certain area. Then, you know, you're going to totally mess up this, that, and the other. They'll also see God work. They'll say, wait a minute, that person is no good in this area. How in the world did that work out for this person? They'll get nosy about your life. Then they'll find out you pray a lot. Then they'll find out you don't waver, you know, in certain areas of your life. Maybe not all. They're going to say, well, this person is just like me. They have some of the same hangups I do. But look, they made it through. How did they do this? Oh, they're a Christian. You know what that does? That brings glory to Christ. Whenever somebody looks at your life and they see themselves in your life, but they see the Lord working things out in your life that they know is impossible for anybody to work out, that glorifies Christ. Do you know that? That glorifies God. You, your, your life is going to be used to glorify God in the eyes of somebody else. Because the Bible says, in some capacity, we will be utilized to bring Christ glory we do that through our own independent honesty, not hiding, not trying to throw up a facade to keep people away from us or anything else because God will slowly have us discovered in that way. Even the change of him raising you brings him glory because when a person sees you change and they see themselves in you, in other words, some of the same characteristics and habits and things like that, when they see you change, they start changing, right? They do. When they see you have a breakthrough, they have their breakthrough. If they saw you go through something impossible, you didn't receive a healing or anything else, and with tears, you, you continue to pray and trust. You had a positive attitude, right? As soon as you have your breakthrough, they're going to be happy for you, number one. Not jealous of you, happy for you. Why? Because they saw you hang on with all you had. They're also going to fall to their knees and say, Lord Jesus, I want the same thing. See, you don't know this, but people who watch your life, they're really looking for a key. The same way many of you guys come to listen because you're listening for something specific. You'll know when you hear it. You really are. You're listening for something very specific. Your life is like that to somebody else. They're looking at your life. They may criticize you. They may talk trash to you and everything else. The key is they're looking at your life. They cannot help but to look at your life because there's something in your story that's going to be used for them. It's almost like they're following an instruction to look at your life, right? To, to them, you are a Bible. And one day, when God delivers you, after a season when they see you hang on with no progress, listen to me carefully. They're going to see you hang on by faith 
but they're going to see no progress in your life. And they're going to ask themselves the question, why is this person hanging on? That's what they're going to say. That means they're going to see you suffer. See, you thought your suffering was for nothing wrong. Everybody sees somebody suffer. And when they see you suffer and they see no progress, but they see you hanging on, they're going to say, why is this person hanging on? Why don't they just curse God and die or something like that, right? But then your breakthrough is going to come. And when it comes, because they've been watching you all those years and you've kept the faith, the Lord has been cleansing you in their eyes, straightening things out. But you're hanging on. You may slip up, fall. You may do things wrong while they're seeing you, but the Lord is cleaning you up. And I'm telling you something. After they see your breakthrough, they're going to say, I watched this person. They were just like me. They kept hanging on. They believed even more. They were trying with all their might to believe. They never betrayed the Lord. And look, he healed them. The doctors didn't do it. It didn't come by any other way. There was no GMO rain that just magically changed this person. That must have been the Lord. That must have been her faith. And then they'll fall to their knees and say, I want what they have. Have. See, some, some of us were born to live by faith. Others must be shocked. They must have an example. It's like watching somebody do something impossible in the world, right? You may think it's impossible to you until you see five or six people do that. When you see somebody else do something, what do you say to yourselves? Well, if they can do it, surely I can learn to do it too. And that gives you what? Hope that you can't accomplish it. You are that hope for somebody else. You're the hope for somebody else. But the key is they must see you hang on in times when everything is failing and falling around you. They have to see it that way. They have to see things not work out in your life. They have to see it. And when the Lord delivers you, when he does the impossible, he's going to do it in view of all those who saw the calamities in your life. You know what they're going to say? They're going to say, I, that's what I want. I want the real thing. I want the real thing. Because at that point, you're going to be known as the real deal, right? They're going to say, that person's the real deal. That's what they'll say. You're not going to have to tell them anything. They're going to say, that person's the real deal. I saw that person. I saw that person be delivered. You know, in the Bible, when it says that uh, by way of a witness, I'm going to paraphrase, by way of a witness is your greatest testimony. They will become your testimony. They will tell other people, you see that person over there, I saw that person struggle for years, and I know it was only God that delivered them. They will amplify your, you won't have to say a word. They're going to spread your story. And let me tell you something. If they spread your story and you leave this world, you're going to be glorifying God long after you leave this world because your story is going to exist and that story is going to be about a breakthrough. You will have become an example of the goodness of our Lord. But what does that take, though? That takes a committed person who is ready to receive the word of the Lord given any circumstances without complaints, not to be a Mr. know -all. Let me tell you something about being a Mr. If you look at a Mr. know -all, you know, you ever meet a person, they know everything about scripture. Those people, they, they, they seem like they, they, to themselves, almost like you can convince yourself that you're in good standing, but other people don't see you like that. They don't see you. It's almost like those are forgotten people. You see a person who doesn't know a lot, Right but they're hanging on. They're going to tug at every heartstring you have. You're going to remember that person. You're going to see all the steps. They're going to have the greatest testimony. They're going to have the greatest one. The know-it-alls will not. They're easily forgotten. Ambitious people follow the know-it-alls, but ambitious people are ambitious for themselves, right? But the person that does not know a lot, they become these icons, these images of faith that people keep in their minds and hearts. They become the story people are willing to live. See, when people see you suffer, go through things, but you're hanging on and your world collapses, all of a sudden you're delivered. Then they're going to be ready to go through everything to be delivered. Now you're starting to catch fire. Everybody else catches fire too. Now you're doing a thorough work, right? A thorough work. That happens a lot. 
And even though I can see it with many of your lives, you've been set up to give God glory in the greatest way you have. It's kind of easy for me to see because the first time I went through things, I wasn't so quiet. I wasn't. But then things began to click. And I'll, you know, it was at that one time when a fellow soldier came up after four years and they said he watched me go through a lot, everything. But I always kept praying. I kept the faith. And that made the difference in his life. I couldn't believe when I heard that because to me at that time, I felt like, you know, I, I'm not making, I'm making no impact for the kingdom of God. And I, I used, you remember, I used to tell you guys, you got to, you got to understand something. Somebody's always watching him. It didn't matter if you live in the bushes by yourself and you don't see anybody. Somebody's watching him. Somebody's watching him. And to a lot of people out there, you're going to be cl the closest thing to Christ they'll ever see. The closest thing to the Bible they'll ever see. Your story is important to them especially to those who seem to know all about your story and get on your nerves. Anybody have somebody like that in their lives, right? Everybody has a person like this in their lives. You can be in your home with the windows and doors and everything shut, open your refrigerator and the door falls off. You get a phone call from this person. They'll say, ah, is everything going okay? They'll go like that. And, just, and then you'll think to yourself, wait a minute, why is this person always around when something falls apart? Well, now you know why. Now you know why. Now you know why. Now you know why. It's almost like they're told when to look at you. And it always happens in times when a little distress is involved in it. They don't see the good stuff. They remember all the failures because they're meant to remember the failures. That means you've been picked for a breakthrough. When you know that, that makes sense of your life, doesn't it? You'll say, ah, oh, oh, really? Now I know. Now I know. Now I know. Why well, I can't have this yet. Why well, this won't take place yet. Now I know why well, my heart is the way it is. Why well, that, that, that war that's being fought in my heart is happening the way it is. You thought it was the devil, didn't you? You thought the devil had assigned somebody to scoff you? No. Satan loses when a person starts looking at you, regardless of your state. I'm going to take a break. I'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT. You guys got my motor mouth is going. I'm trying to get a point across. Oh, hopefully, it's coming across. Thank you. There's more to you than you think. And it's very simple, too. It's, it's a very simple thing, but a very holy thing. A very holy thing to know. I'll be back in just a few minutes right here at COT. All right, guys, we're back. Where are we going with this? Where are you going with this, Mike? I'm emphasizing something to you all that the Lord has given you guys. He's given you guys something. He's given all of us insights. He gives us the truth. But have you noticed the war? Have you guys noticed the war? It's that statement of trust the science. The statement I can't stand. The statement an antichrist type figure mandates. That statement. Hmm? That statement. Nothing wrong with science. But it should never outweigh the word of God. That's precisely what's happening in these days, is this science junk. So much so, people are going to be 100% submissive to science and academia and be 100% led astray. And when the Lord says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you, that's when their identity will be known. Because Jesus tells the truth. God tells the truth, right? He never knew them. He doesn't know them right now. He won't know them then because they were never to be in the fold. But they are infiltrators. They most certainly are. Hmm? Now, all of us to a degree have been messed up in sin. That's not what I'm talking about. There are others mingled among you. 
They will never stop doing what they're doing. They're going to sneak their way in as often as they can. They will pervert and tear down and turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness every single time. These are the ones that are perverting the world to always go to data points. At the beginning of this conversation, I told you something that I've seen in observation. Out of all the simulations and data points, every single last one of them didn't pan out. But out of everything God has given me, nothing has failed. Nothing. The Lord has also given you guys things. Things sometimes you thought were outlandish. You just didn't know whether it was a warning, right? If it was an advisement, you didn't know which one it was. But he certainly gave it to you. And when it took place, you couldn't tell a soul. You knew it yourself, but you had no witnesses to what the Lord gave you. But it absolutely took place. Everybody has gone through this. These days, one of, the, one of the biggest things that will come that will cause people to fold inwardly are the threats. Listen to what I'm talking to you about. Suppose right now it became somebody were to ask you and they said, listen, are you going to believe in the, you know, the, the, the life that you're living in or some faith stuff? And if you say faith, they're going to say, okay, we, you, your citizenship is revoked. No more bank card, no more license. You have 30 days to move. We don't know where you're going to move to, but you got to get out of here. You can have no utilities or anything else because we're going to strike you from the system. What do you think the average person would do? I tell you, they've already done it in small stages in small stages people have already chosen against keeping their faith publicly which is why they hide it i'm telling you it's already happening and that many wear the mark of the beast on their sleeve and if a person does not have experience right with what the lord is giving them they're going to regret that they never paid close attention to it. They're going to regret throwing those pearls away. They're going to regret it. Do you guys know what's stated in the Bible? I'm going to read something to you guys. I'm going to read something. I'm going to show you something. Now, I'm not the smartest person in the world, right? By no means. But I believe in the word of God. And there are certain things in the word of God that are undeniable. How God gives his word, right? How dreams are important. Not a filthy dreamer. Not a filthy dream. Now, see, let me explain something to you guys. There's a part in the context of the scripture where a person is a filthy dreamer or a selfish dreamer. And this, these people will have dreams to elevate themselves. In other words, they will, they have no problem mixing what, what they've been actually given with selfish, ambitious goals. And God speaks against these people. These are filthy dreamers, right? God gives what he gives in many different, I can't, honestly, I cannot tell, truth be told, sometimes I can't tell if it's a dream or one of those other things. And I say other things because there are lots of times I'm sitting upright. And then all of a sudden I realize I'm, I come back to myself and I'm sitting upright, having seen some things, but still, I don't know if I, it, whatever, I don't know what it is. Right. And I don't like visions. I don't like how dreams begin. I don't like the feelings that come over me or any of those things, those things I don't like, but you have other folks. We're filthy dreamers, deeply involved with their own desires and they, um, when they communicate things, it is selfish to a high degree. So con the context of a dream is extremely important. Um, and it's up to the individual. And they're, they have to be honest with this. And Christians with discernment will know. God said, you will know. You will know. There are even certain times God will give somebody a dream that will come. It, it'll come true. 
hear me on this, it'll come true. Every single aspect will come true. Then God says, this person will say, let us go and serve other gods. Now, they may not say that directly, but the Lord says, he will give other people dreams like they're a prophet, and they will absolutely come true. And those people who have these dreams will lead you away from the Lord. And God says he does this to see if you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. Do you see that? So he'll give somebody a dream that will come absolutely true. It'll be true. Every aspect of it will be true. But the, the, the goal of that dream, the goal of that prophetic dream this person will have will be to lead you away from the Almighty. And God says he does this. He didn't say the devil does this. He said he does this to see if you love him with all of what you are. In other words, if you can be led astray, you're going to be led astray. If you love the Lord, it's impossible for you to be led astray. Hmm? It's impossible. Impossible. I, can, I will only go in a direction, right, that I ultimately choose to go in. You know what happens if somebody tries to pull you in their own direction? You resist automatically. Doesn't matter who you are, you're going to resist. You can't be, some, somebody can't just pull you in any direction they want to. It has to be appealing to you, right? Temptation is what? What is a temptation? Temptation is when somebody will put something before you that you already desire. That's what a temptation is. If somebody puts something before you that you have zero desire for, they, you can't be tempted because it's not within you. Temptation, right? When, we're, when we go into temptation, we're drawn away of our own lusts. That's what the Bible says. We're drawn away and tempted of our own lusts. Satan can present to you the desires that are already within you. He cannot present to you something that's not within you and then tempt you by it. You're not going to follow that direction. So we can never say, oh, I was just tempted into doing it unfairly. No, it isn't. You had that desire in you. And the Lord doesn't want us. He doesn't lead us into temptation, but he delivers us from evil. And because of this, we go through a lot of trials that will make a temptation surface so that we can, so it can be dealt with. God does not force you to be clean by way of your request. In your willingness, you will be clean through the blood of the Lamb. So when something surfaces, guess what? That's when you address it, not ignore it. That's when you address it. You address that thing. Okay? But the Lord has given you guys something. He's given you guys something. He's given me things. He's given you things. How much more would this body of Christ develop if we were not to think they're so foolish, we can't share it, or nobody believes in this, we can't share it, right? we got to get away from that. Time to take another step in our faith in the direction of help for more people. We see the state of this world, but I can, I can tell you by locking things up within yourself, having no confidence in what the Lord gives you, right? That's not going to do anybody any good. That's why we're told to spread the gospel, not, not just keep it to ourselves, right? But to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to share the good news. We have a mandate to do that. Hmm? Not to keep everything within ourselves. Not to do that. Because if we do, who benefits? And God's way is this, that through people, through people, through men, through men, he'll disseminate his word through men. Mm -hmm. somebody said that was a good question what question i missed it who asked a good question and i didn't see it i totally missed it anybody share something really good who who uh who does this where's it at okay michelle spill the beans somebody said such a great question Retype the question so I can see it. If you guys have any questions right now, go ahead and let them rip. And just a couple, not a whole bunch. Just a couple. Not a whole bunch. Oh, 
okay, no problem, no problem. But but you guys see where I'm going with this, right? So listen, listen, listen. This is my proposal to you because I believe in doing things for other folks, right? We're we're COT is in a in a different place right now. We we you know there's something I refer to as a works ministries, right? COT began not with talking, but with just simply supplying s- small nutritional packs and water to as many as we could, right? COT started a long time ago. The online section of COT started when Angela uh, came to the mix, right? But the works ministry is where the, my heart of heart is, right? And so to have people fed, for example, I do something I don't talk about a lot. There, starvation is in America big time, all the time. Starvation is, right? I can tell you right now, COT feeds people every single day. People that cannot feed themselves every single day. And I thank God for that. I do. I thank God for that. It, 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 I go broke for that. It doesn't matter if I go broke, but I go broke for that to feed people every single day, every single day, every single day without fail, every single day. And it, it is, it is, um, I don't mention it because that's something I will always do, right? It's, I'm going to always do that. No matter what uh, succeeds or does not, I'm going to always do that. It just so happens that slowly but surely the Lord is expanding us, but it really is time to get our house in order uh, spiritually, I mean, spiritually in order. The assaults are coming. The opposition is coming, right? People are going to need, um, they're going to have necessities of spiritual things, right? And while we have this time of little to no opposition, because in truth, we have little to no opposition to what we're doing, little to none. That will always be that way. We know this by prophecy. It's time to utilize everybody, which is why we're called council of time. Council of time is not um, you know, just just a, a statement of time. Council of time means it comes from a collection of people, a diverse set of people. That's why the word council is in there. I don't believe the truth is ever going to travel through just one person. I don't believe that because the Lord gives us everything in part. That means we have bits and pieces of a truth collectively. We have the whole truth individually. Individually we do, right? Individually. So collectively when we come together right because folks we're going to be physically together so it's time to get some things in order so that when we hit the ground we can hit the ground running in a good way for folks to make a difference for folks not for prestige not for notoriety but to actually make a difference right and i can only you know me as an individual because it took a long time for me to ever get to that point. Me as an individual, I can only do so much. My issue was trust of other individuals. It really was trust. Specifically, this is, I know it sounds distasteful, but I didn't trust civilians. I didn't, I didn't trust any civilian out there because they whined too much. I, that was my, I'm just confessing. My take on civilians was that they complain about everything. And they have not, they have not given blood for hardly anything, but they complain too much. Everything is a complaint. Nothing is right. This, that, and the other, right? So the majority of my life has not been immersed in that type of environment, right? It was basically, you know, different for me. Different for most of you who understand what I'm talking about. When you wear that uniform, you serve differently. You served it, but you don't complain, right? For people you don't even know, you make the greatest sacrifices. For people that will never know you ever made that sacrifice, and yet they still complain. You provide an umbrella of freedom for folks, and you ensure that umbrella with your life. And then you come, you know, with most people, they can, they find something to complain about. So I had trust issues because I know how fickle people can be in their freedom when when a person is absolutely free they can change their mind in a heartbeat they're not really committed to anything as soon as they see it non it, it won't uh if they see that it's not beneficial to them they're gone it's, it's almost like a lot of people don't have commitment within them right and commitment is something that is uh it's a staple to folks in uniform commitment to one another commitment to whatever ideology that you follow, it's a commitment there. And above all things, that commitment outweighs everything. And to keep that commitment, um, you do things. You do things, right? So, we have a time coming that's not going to be friendly. There's some things that have to be, 
I'm, I'm praying that we're all in position for this. I know we won't be. Because I've seen that too much. I've said that so many times. People are going to be caught off guard. But it too will serve its purpose. And what I'm asking you guys to do is this. But this additional step in faith takes, number one, a lot of study. A lot of study. It takes a lot of prayer. Lots of prayer. Lots of prayer. It actually takes fasting. And understanding what a fasting is for. Not a debate on fasting. Right? Um, I fast quite a bit, but I never tell anybody when I'm going to fast. I never announce my fast. That's not people's business. That's between me and my father. In fact, most things I do is between me and my father, especially when I do good. The Lord says, do your good deeds in secret that your father may reward you openly. When he rewards you openly is when he accepts you into eternal life, right? He said, when you pray, go in your secret place. Don't think you're going to be heard for your many words. But when you pray, go in. In other words, sincerely do things. Right? People will scoff you. People will say all manner of evil against you. That's natural because they think you're not doing anything. Right? And then when they find out what you're doing, they back up 29,000 steps and then they feel real deeply. There was a guy recently in COT. Um, he saw the truck and I noticed somebody kept writing an email, writing an email. I mean, it was a big, huge, long apology about a whole bunch of stuff. And I haven't seen this guy since, my goodness, it had to be 2013 or something like that. But he saw the, one of the trucks and he was just flow, he was just messed up. And of course, I did ask him, don't, don't spread that around. If you see it, you see it. If you don't, you don't. Right. And, um, because it's only a, a caption on one side of the truck for license purposes. And this guy, he just, that's what they do. They apologize, apologize, because when they don't see it, right, they, they can't, uh, what can you do with They can't do anything about that. And so, but when they do see it, I'm telling you something. If you maintain your peace, if you stay on mission, when they see it, a big change is going to be had in their lives. It's a good change too, because once a person sees what you've been actually doing and they spoke against it totally wrong, they spoke against it, it was totally wrong. They, it makes them a better person. It really does. It makes him a better person. Nobody's going to be so quick to do that twice. All of us have done that. All of us have actually said that, uh, you know, there are people in our lives we thought weren't doing anything. We had no idea what they were doing. And when we found out, it made us better people, didn't it? It made us reserve our instant comments um, a little. It helped us. It humbled us to a degree. So it helps people out when they do this. But those things take place. You have to just charge on and continue to do an intimate work, whatever God called you for, whatever he called you for. Make sure you're doing it for him. And to do something for the living God is to make sure that the people receive it. Because when you do something for him, it's going to be a benefit to other folks, right? Other folks. Somebody says, questioning your opinion, thoughts of Pelosi steps foot in, don't know how to spell it, Taiwan. In your opinion or thoughts on, well, I, guys, I really don't do ifs, right? I don't do ifs because I know that sometimes opinion, if somebody has an opinion of something, right? Often when somebody has an opinion before something happens, uh, you get a lot of people that weigh in on that opinion. The more they talk about it, amazingly, it turns into fact before it ever happens. Then people are convinced and then they say, well, you know, Pelosi steps foot there, we're going to war, or we're not going to war, or something like that, right? And then uh, I, 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 when it comes to opinions like that, I kind of reserve them as far as the um, uh, results are going to be because I have not sought the Lord. I didn't ask him anything on that, right? Now, if I were to ask the Lord, Lord, is uh, first of all, is she really going, and what do I need to prep for? I believe the Lord would give me an answer. But I've not taken those steps yet. So I really don't have a comment on that, right, as far as what will take place. I mean, I could guess like the next person, but guessing is no good. Guessing, we don't have to guess. We can seek the Lord for the absolute truth. I, I tell you what, though, the person with that question, seek the Lord for that truth. And then when he gives you the answer, should he give you that answer, uh, just let us know about it. Okay, just let us know about it. That's all. Somebody says, is a person in the coffin male or female? Well, I'll tell you this. I saw that person's face 
clearly. I've never seen anybody in a coffin in any thing I've seen in a dream or a vision or something like that. But this person's face was 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 so clear. And when that takes place, I, I don't look forward to that taking place. When that takes place, there are going to be problems, guys. That's why... Listen, after that happens, because it, it'll happen, it'll unfold in a way that's somewhat subtle, um, but notable, right? I already know what's going to happen when that takes place. Um, in fact, when that takes place, there'll be another issue that people are going to be dealing with. And actually, if you're not careful, you might miss it. People have a habit of moving on to the next subject so fast. But during that time, that that uh, that coffin was the one thing that caught my eye. What happened immediately following that? That was uh, somewhat devastating, but necessary. But it's still devastating, right? When that time comes, we'll go over quite a few things, things you've heard before, but nevertheless, we'll go over those things. The hope here is this, right? If that should come to pass, then when I tell you the next thing, right, um, it will hold a little more value to it. Because it's not easy to communicate with the Lord gives. It's, it's just not. You just can't blurt things out because they have no context. They'll have no place. Man, be like Noah saying, hey, the world's going to flood, and then he runs off. Okay, that, what, what does that mean? People would say, what does that mean? What does that mean, the world's going to flood? Nobody knows what that means. And so even with that message, it took people actually seeing the labors behind the preparations, right? As he was saying that, he was also laboring. He was also laboring. He was doing things in, in, while I was doing this to get prepared. And so when it actually took place, then people understood and they could see. They could actually see. And you know what? I, I never went over this before, but all those preparations for the ark, all the scoffing and everything else, it paid off in the life of the sons that he had. Do you know that? Without the scoffing and the preparations, um, his sons would have not carried on the charge like they did. They wouldn't have. They had to see that. They had to go through that. In this case, uh, we're going to go through some pretty horrific things, but it takes context because if I were to blurt out um, something that makes me actually nervous, I know it's coming, but if I were to blurt that out, there's no telling what people would call me because there, it, it takes context. It takes great context. Are we still online? Hold on, guys. Let me make sure we're still online. That was a fuse or something. No, we're still we're still good. We're still good. I guess the power went out, but we still have power here, so we're good to go. Anyway, what you can expect is this. You guys, you remember when I told you about those folks that were coming from all walks of life, and all of a sudden one day they started coordinating. They did some coordinated thing, right? You guys remember that? how they uh, they weren't really talking to anybody. Everybody knew what to do. There were people who were soldiers and people shopping in a grocery store and police officers and cab drivers and all these people. They began to work in tandem like ants together. They were not discussing anything. The guy told me to get out of the cab to, to get out, right? They wouldn't tell you anything twice. If they had to tell you anything twice, you were going to die. That's how stern they were. They were stern how they put everything in lockdown in less than, had to be less than an hour. And people were in their homes looking at TV, awaiting their fate because they didn't know if somebody was coming to their door or not. These people changed in a heartbeat and they were everywhere, everywhere. They were everywhere. Times like that will face in a similar fashion, in a similar fashion will face. That's going to throw people into chaos and confusion. The only way to prepare for that is to be spiritually ready for all of what God said you'd prepare for. That, that Listen, that's why when it comes to, I know a lot of people say, well, the rapture's coming. You don't need to look at that wrong. If God said you're going to be blessed by keeping the words of something, then it's relevant to your life. It's relevant to your life. 
If the Lord said, blessed is he that reads the words of this prophecy, then blessed is he that reads and keeps the words of those prophecy that does not alter anything or anything else. Blessed is that person. Don't ever, don't ignore it. Don't keep it. It's going to be relevant to your lives. See, the issue is we don't know how. We don't know how it's going to be relevant, but it's going to be relevant. The other thing is you don't know how long you're going to be here. Right? Is the Lord coming back to get his people? Will they change in a twinkling of an eye? Yes, they will. But the word is specific. That day shall not come lest there come a falling away. First, that man of perdition be revealed. And then after that, those who are alive at that time, after that, things take place, not before. And see, we have to keep this in context. Because if we're not careful, even with that, people will alter that. And there are a lot of people saying, we're going to be gone before the beast gets here. Well, the man of perdition is the beast, and he has to be revealed. If he's revealed, he's going to be known. If he's going to be known, he's going to institute things because he rises by way of this action he takes in Jerusalem. And, and he starts to put his tabernacles all over the place. Now, it doesn't mean we have to fall for it, but yes, we got to be ready for that. We can't just assume that we're, you know, that somehow Paul made a mistake. But don't do that. Don't do that. Just read the word, accept it as it is. One of the keys of reading the word of God is don't read it to save your own skin. Read it that your soul may be saved. Be a part of what the Lord is doing. I ask people all the time, do you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ? They say, yeah. I said, but wait a minute. Do you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the good news of Jesus Christ? They say, yes. I said, okay, so you believe that a person must go through troubles. They said, well, no, not exactly. I said, wait a minute. If you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you believe in the method by which he's raising all of us. You believe in his method of deliverance. If you believe in his good news, you had to believe in all the good news, not the little piece that seems beneficial, but all of it. Hmm? All of it. But sometimes we... We slack off reading the word and we start going with the hearsays and we can't do that, right? We can't, not now. We can't do that now. And God's given you guys too much. Too much is wrapped up within you guys. This world needs, but because they don't need everything I have to say, they will need everything we have to say collectively, right? Everything. Somebody had a question. Was the vomit dream after the stone steps the vomit was totally separate that that dream about the vomit was this i was standing in this place and it looked like it was it was this it was in the desert it was this place in the desert and this guy was speaking as this guy spoke he would regurgitate white vomit and people would go and drink it right out of his mouth white pure vomit it was i call it vomit because it came out of him i looked around and i said how do i get out of this place and as i looked i saw spiders with camo vests with four legs they were about the spiders were about they had to be about five feet tall five or six feet tall anybody who tried to escape this place they were going to be brutally assaulted killed by these spider looking things right Sorry, Flash. But they would be assaulted so nobody could leave. But nobody, it's almost like these things were guarding. A person did try to leave. He saw the truth. He went around a corner and he started to run outside of the city. And I was like, oh, they're going to get him. And they did get him. And I was mortified. And then I went to go look to see what he saw. And as I looked back, I saw this guy that everybody was going to, everybody was listening to. This guy was on his side. He was talking. As I looked, his spinal cord got longer, right? It got longer, and his shoulders began to contort, like, like his bone structure was changing on the inside. I said, oh, my, something's in this guy. So I ran back around the corner like I never did see him, right? Because I was like a chicken in this dream. This dream was wild. And I went back, and then they turned this place into a university. They had long forgotten about the guy that was issuing out those words. He would still write. Every day he would write something. And every day they would, they would take it, print it, and give it to all the people there. All of a sudden, uh, as the, the, what they were exchanging was pure because it wasn't something that would make you sick. That's how pure it looked. It looked pure white. 
pure white. It wasn't runny. It was almost like a, it's hard to explain. I called it what I called it because he was exchanging it with everybody there. They were receiving what he was giving, but it was regurgitated, right? Stuff. No good. It's no good. Well, it shocked me to find out what they were, this, what, what was being written were things in the Bible. What this guy was talking about was the gospel. Hmm? He was talking about the gospel. The gospel he was giving out was from a demonic entity and not one to play with either. Something that had um, forces on the earth that nobody could recognize immediately. And people were accepting what he was giving. And as they would accept it, they were becoming just like this individual. And he made universities all over the place. And they kept giving out this stuff. And everybody who partook of this could not escape it. Once they partook of this, there was no getting out of it. There was no getting out of it. Once you were in it, because to, when you took, you had to take a vow. It was a ceremony with a vow. You had to take a vow. And once you were in it, there was no redemption for that person after that. None. There was none. But people left and right were accepting of it. So it was both intimidating, but it was very appealing to the people around them. And everybody who partook of it, they were poor at first. But then they were supplied everything they needed afterward. For the, for the sake of security, right, of having little tiny things, they partook of this and they couldn't escape. At the end of it, I saw people crying, desperate, tormented. And they were still there in, in those university buildings that were hollow and empty. And they couldn't escape. They couldn't even ask for redemption. And that was the worst part of it all, is how they knew they were trapped. They knew exactly what they did. But then when I went up to the person, because I was trying to ask them, what were they so sorrowful? What, you know, what are you crying about? They said, because it's over. I said, because what's over? They said, we're not going to have our, our, our good life anymore. They were not crying that they had gone against the Lord. They were crying because they wouldn't have their lifestyle back. And then at that point in the dream, uh, all my sympathy left. And it was almost like I was saying inside, goody, goody, gumdrops. It's what you get. But because it made me angry. How can somebody weep and cry because they won't have their lifestyle? All they wanted was their lifestyle. That's all they wanted. They turned the word of God into an element, a perverted element to appease their, their conscience or something, but they by no means lived by it. They did not live by it. They went through all the motions. They did not live by it. It was simply part of their culture. It was not in them. And, and those people accepted it was it, what they accepted was well they got exactly what they deserved but i have no sympathy for them even to this day after having that dream if a person i'm telling you now if a person doesn't make it i can have no sympathy for them because it's almost like i can see what they really are i have no sympathy for somebody who won't make it because the lord if the lord sits there and he says depart from me you worker of iniquity i never knew you if he never knew them then they had no inheritance from the beginning Jesus gave his hints. All who have come to me, Jesus said, the Father hath given me, and I will in no wise lose. That means if you truly believe in Christ, I mean if you truthfully believe in him, then you believe in his gospel, not some made-up gospel. You believe in his method, his ways, not man's stuff, but I'm talking about the Messiah's, his ways. That means you, you believe in forgiveness, right? That means you believe in um all these principles Jesus taught, you believe in them. You actually believe in them. You embrace them. You belong to him, and you will not be lost. I'll boldly say that. You will not be lost. But all there, there are certain people that look like they believe in his ways and things like that, but they do not. They're doing what they're doing to appease their conscience because as they are in the flesh too, they're going to have, a, they're gonna have somewhat of a, an, an issue with wrongdoing. They override that wrongdoing in different ways. 
because in their heart of hearts, they are self-serving. And I have no sympathy for them because anybody who makes it belong to God in the first place. Anybody who does not make it never belong to the living God in the first place. And they were of a different origin. How could I feel sorry for someone of a different origin? How? I'm not. That's when I lost my sympathy that day. You know, because most people say, um, it's true, because we don't know all these things. We'll say, well, you know, I'm, it's bad when a person perishes out. Even at, if a person died outside of Christ at a funeral, it would break my heart because I'd always feel like I didn't do enough. Right? I did. That was genuinely how I felt. But after having that, and that dream was only a few years ago, I, it's almost like my sympathy, it's almost like a correction came. How can I feel sorry for someone who never, never, never believed in Christ or never loved him, was never loyal to him, was never going to be loyal, but did everything they could do to fit in with us, only to corrupt us, only to serve their selfish needs, only to shield themselves in times of, you know, different times of the earth. They were using everybody to save their own skins. How can I feel sorry for a person like that? There are people out there now who have, who have done the ultimate evil act and they are truly sorrowful. And they have accepted Christ. And I believe those people are going to be fully redeemed. I believe that. But there are people out there who have never done wrong in their lives, squeaky clean. And they do not love our Lord. And those people are not going to make it. No matter what. No matter what history they have. Because a lot of people look for people's credentials. Let me tell you something. The devil has people in place with the best credentials. God's people always seem to have issues and problems. The devil is the one that has all these people with the good credentials. And that's how he gets people. Why would God's children have the best credentials in Satan's kingdoms all over the earth? In my career, I've noticed Dark people have the best credentials. I'm talking about people who have dead hearts. Conscience is seared with a hot iron. They have the best credentials. In your case, those of you who believe, you hit brick walls. There's something in your record that doesn't smell good. In every single believer's life, there's something in their record that does not smell good. It doesn't smell good. A lot of people are good at hiding whatever it is that does not smell good. But they try to walk around like the people who do smell good, right? No one need do that. No one. God said the world is against his word. So it's going to be against you. And if it's against you, you better believe it has tripped you in life. Hmm? But do you see in that small thing how many people are, they're looking for, they're actually looking for Satan's qualifications among many people. They are. They're looking for that person who is squeaky clean. That's precisely what they're going to get. That's how they're going to be deceived. Or well, that's one way they're going to be deceived. Through that. People want to trust something that has never made a mistake. I don't trust anything that's never fallen apart or made a mistake. I don't trust a brand new computer when it comes in until it has a hiccup. I have to know its true potential. And nothing is perfect except our Father. I don't trust anything that would appear to be perfect. I do not, because that is mimicry of the one who is perfect. So I don't trust it. And I don't know a person until I know the worst side of them. And when I know the worst side, that's the only time I can truly embrace a person. I have to know where they fall apart at, in truth. If somebody shows me only the good sides of themselves, I cannot embrace that person because I don't know them. But when I see a person fall, and when I see what they're struggling with and little things like that, I can embrace them with all love. But I don't know a person. If I just see the squeaky clean side, because I don't judge a person by their, I don't look at a person by their deeds or what they have done. I see people differently, but a person who would, who would put away, right? Anything they skipped and messed up on, they're not quite there yet, which means they can alter, um, they can alter things within themselves so quick that they could do things you wouldn't want them to do that they could potentially do it. But a person who is who has fallen 
gotten back up and fallen, gotten back up. They have nothing to hide, right? Those people have, they have fallen. They're not looking to make themselves famous. They're not doing what they're doing to use people to get ahead. They're not doing any of those things. They're trying to work out their salvation. Those people can be truly embraced. They really can. Doesn't matter how bad they messed up. Doesn't matter what they did. In fact, the more they have messed up, the more I seem to love them. I love people even more when they mess up bad like that. But I certainly don't see people the way the world does. The world lives by a different standard. I can maneuver in that standard, but I will never be part of the world. I'll never be. I'll never agree with what they do. I don't agree with hardly anything they do. Some things they do is, you know, is, is, is effective. But I'll never be a part of the world. I have a natural recoil against all these things of the world. All their processes I do not like. I don't accept. In the world, somebody has to die in order for somebody else to get ahead. What kind of system is that? You eat a double portion, somebody else is going to starve for a week. What, what kind of world is that? That's the way it's designed. No, I don't think so. At any rate, there it is. Folks, so listen. What the Lord is giving you is, is, is prize. It's very important. And um, it, it's time to call in the council on quite a few things. Quite a few things. Now, I've been bogging my brain working out this little, I, I mean, I've really been overloading my brain trying to figure out how I'm going to do something, but uh, I'll fill you guys in. Listen, and also, also, for the sake of understanding, um, some of the subjects that we have, right? Like, like uh, I think I, I'm I'm debating to give a presentation all by video. It's a video. It's a video is already finished. I'm debating to post that to the COT YouTube. So that you guys can, uh, because that's an actual presentation. It's going to be one of our first presentations. Now, I may show that tomorrow, but what it does is it goes over an issue. Some of the dimensions, the real dimensions of an issue. So that you can get an overview of how you're affected by some of these things that are happening in the world and how to combat them. Your flesh, a small example, your flesh feels and thinks and tries to do things one way but spiritually we're given instruction on how to live right and it's important that a person know the difference between the two it's very important and if they have that if they know that difference and somebody were to show them what their flesh was. It, it's kind of like a forecast. If I were to tell you guys, okay, folks are going in the desert. It's going to be very hot there. So bring five quarts of water, right? That's preparation. You know, you're going to get hot. Everybody knows they're going to get hot. They're going to get thirsty. They're going to have to drink more water, right? To supply their flesh, their vehicle, so they can continue in the desert. Well, there are things in the world just like that. Sometimes men do things that will affect your physiology and when your physical body is affected and you don't know what's going on it can it can app it can uh, you know kind of send you in a loop but if you were to know that the sun's activity is going to cause you to start losing memory your short-term memory well then you wouldn't go into a panic nor would you get aggravated if all of a sudden you started having short-term memory loss right if you were to find out that the emissions of the earth, right, are going to raise, are, are going to cause erratic heartbeats, uh, given a certain time, then you would understand, oh, this fluttering I feel is not nervousness. It's probably because of so-and-so. And you would take that under consideration. And what I'm telling you is that when you understand your environment, you can account for a few things. If you don't understand your environment, you're left guessing. You get, uh, people get, out of place because they don't know what's happening around them, right? They don't know. And so there are lots of things mankind is doing that will affect your body. It will affect it. And when you understand how it interacts with you physically, right, you can then put it into its place and continue on. The whole thing is just that you never stop with the work the Lord has charged you with. That you don't give a pause 
right? Don't give a pause because you think you, you're developing some deadly disease and become fearful and this, that, and the other, but to have everything in context. Always remembering the principles of the Lord. In other words, like, like death itself, lots of people are afraid they're going to kick the bucket. You cannot pass from this world until Jesus says you're going to pass from this world. How about that? So it doesn't matter what comes, you're not going to die until Jesus agrees to it, right? You just won't die. So there it is. A lot of people are afraid of death. Well, if I do this, I might die. Or if I get caught in this situation, I might die. And then they start living their lives by if moments. You need not do that. Have surety in your steps. The Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Trust where he's guiding you. You just have to make sure you're not guiding yourself. And self-preservation is a thing that people have to learn to identify and not be afraid of. Right? The storm is coming. And when this storm comes, many are going to run when they shouldn't have run at all. This storm is a confrontation of many things we have suppressed within ourselves. These situations are going to bring them out. The Lord will bring them out that they may be uprooted forever. Things that will only surface in these times, right? That's why these times have come. And they will come also that you may be effective in whatever ministry the Lord gave you. Hmm? They will complement the Lord's work. That's what they'll do. The world is not going to wake up because we've asked them to, nor are they going to consider the word because we keep talking louder and louder. It will take situations, unbelievable situations. It will take absolute an absolute consuming of a person's assets to get them to finally consider the Lord in the first place. Some of our brothers and sisters are steeped in worldly doctrine and the Lord must remove that first, give them that moment of clarity that they may see or hear what you have been assigned to bring them. He has to prepare them. All these things happening in the world are preparing people to hear from the Lord like a last call. And if you've gone through things first in your family, as it seems, and you've been selected, you've been picked to go through all this stuff that you may be able to communicate with them. So your job is coming up. It's almost time for you to clock in. To this date, many of us have been, we've been learning, practicing, right? Evaluating ourselves, becoming honest with ourselves. We've been growing. But a time of work is coming like never before. And the harvest, the harvest is ready. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, how to discern if a pastor is trying to take advantage of my recently widowed family member? Does that family member believe in Christ? I have to ask. I'll tell you why. If a pastor ever takes advantage of anybody, listen to me. Don't you ever think he will escape what's coming to him. If anybody wears the banner of a pastor and seeks to deceive a person by way of assets of this world, they will not escape. Now, to catch a thief, you have to catch him stealing something. Things are often set out that somebody who is a thief may steal it, that that thief may be caught and pay the price. A thief will deny he's a thief unless he steals. A thief could have theft in his heart all day. You cannot convict him nor say he's wrong if he has not taken a thing. But if you set up something this thief has a strong desire toward that he would sell his own mother to acquire, the only way to bring that out is to have that object propped up. People are used that way a lot. Sometimes people deny that they're evil until they give way to their own temptations. But listen, something beautiful happens because if that thief is not really meant to perish, but is meant to have eternal life, that situation can bring him out of denial. 
Now, we all know that in order for a person to reach that point, they have to perceive that they have taken from the innocent. Who would agree to be that innocent person to be utilized in this situation to bring about the change in this thief once and for all? That's the question. To a degree, everybody is utilized. It is written in the Bible that in the Father's house there are vessels of honor and dishonor. Now, we're not talking about condemnation. We're talking about honor and dishonor. There are many vessels, vessels of honor and dishonor. All of them are in the Father's house. At certain points in times, all of us have been vessels of dishonor. All of us have been utilized as vessels of honor. To be utilized, right, is key. But let the Lord work everything out. No thief gets away with their thefts. The Lord's redemption is real. And if he has set up a circumstance for the salvation of another, right, cover that person with prayer. You can stop a thief easy by covering that item with prayer. It's like locked bars. A thief can't get through. Only when we ignore something can a thief take it and never be caught. When a thief is caught, he has to pay back sevenfold. Remember that. Mike, what does it mean when, when talking to a minister and you get instantly sick? What does that mean? Well, now that, that depends. It depends. When people are in the world, right? People of the world can always tell when other people are worldly. You know that? They can always tell. They can always tell. People of the world can always tell. And if you talk to a minister and you become sick, it could be, it could be deception. There are, some, there are several things that happen here. This is all. You could talk to somebody, get sick, and in truth, you could be the one deceived. Right? You can be the one deceived. You can also talk to some, anybody and get sick and it can be because of something in them. Never think all the time something is wrong with them. Always make sure your foundation is, is solid when evaluating this because you're going to have to do this spiritually. You're going to have to do it spiritually. I've seen so many people be deceived by that, come to turn out they had something wrong with them, right? So never assume when you get sick by hearing somebody else that somehow you're so holy that it's not you, right? Never assume that. Also realize Satan always seeks to divide people. He'll do that by physical means. That's where deception comes in, right? Don't fall for those deceitful things. But make this up in your mind. No matter what comes, evaluate somebody by the word of God not by how you feel. Don't do it by feeling because your body can lie to you. In, in fact, it lies all the time. Don't believe me? I see people drinking alcohol and they enjoy it, but are slowly killing them. The body is lying, telling them it's good and it's not. I see people do other things that will surely kill them, but it's enjoyable to them, but it's shortening their time that they would have mobility in the body. See how the body lies. So I don't trust the body. Trust the spirit. Understand that the body has a mechanism, many mechanisms within itself that will often set itself against spiritual things. Don't trust feeling. Put those in their place. Realize that feeling, right, from the body is for that body. But your spirit is different. Now, it's spiritually, if God gives you a warning spiritually about a person and you feel great, you better heed to that warning. Okay? Make that separation as soon as possible and realize that about your flesh will lie to you all the time. All the time. But the spirit God gave you will not. Never operate by feeling. Operate by truth no matter how you feel. There have been times that I've been sicking around people and I knew Satan was trying to get me not to talk to those individuals. Satan doesn't want you to talk to anybody that would point him out in your life. You know that? Satan has often made saints, people who believe in Christ, sick of one another to keep them apart because when they get together, he's defeated. 
Don't trust feeling. Don't do it. Trust the spirit. Don't trust feeling. Don't do that. Your body will lie. Look at simple things and you'll see just how much your body can lie to you. It can lie to you all the time. So I, I hope that makes sense to you. When the veil is lifted, there is no partition where we see those who died or will those, or will those still be only demons and evil spirits? If we see both, how do we know the difference? Well, you, you don't have to. Listen, when the veil is lifted, right? you're also going to see what's within yourselves, and that's going to be the bigger question. Externally, it doesn't matter what I see. To me, it matters what's going on inside. I learned that a long time ago by being put in weird situations. I had to learn never to trust what I see with my eyes. Also, I had to learn true submission and what that was. Every time a person is submitted their eyes are open to truth. You'll see through the mirage into truth when you root it correctly, right? But Jesus said this, that the, he had given to his apostles, he said it himself because he was talking about the resurrection. Jesus is the resurrection. And a lot of people didn't understand that. They, they debated about that back in the day, right? The dead in Christ will rise first. Think about that. Now, when the dead in Christ rise first, the book of Baruch talks about that in other books, about the attack of the Shaddim. Right? There's a time that was prophesied that they don't want anybody to know about, a time when spirits will begin to attack people in the earth. When both demons, right, demonic entities, and these familiar spirits will begin to attack people on the face of the earth. That's the beginning of the lifting of the veil, and it's part of what will happen in the end times. But the Bible is clear to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Right? Paul was explaining to everybody about the resurrection. They, they were fighting him on that. And Jesus descended down into Sheol. Hear me on this. He descended into Sheol. All those who didn't get an opportunity for redemption had their opportunity for redemption. Jesus ascended overcoming death, took the keys of hell and death in the grave with him. Right? He took the keys of hell and death. Those who are dead in Christ, that time, I do not believe that time is instantaneous. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe most often, given given the like the like the flood and the things in Egypt, if you were to read that, you would see that sometimes it reads like things happen instantaneous. But by way of the dates, it did not happen instantaneously. It happened over the span of time. Right? The dead in Christ rising. I know from reading does it's not. In there, that's found in multiple places in the Bible. One place, it clearly describes those who were once, um, they did not receive redemption, will receive redemption. The dead in Christ, those who are dead in Christ, those who have passed away in Christ, right? Those who are dead in Christ, they were given an opportunity even back during the time of Christ, people saw dead ones walking in the streets. One day everybody rises. It is part of, is something described in Revelation also. But your eyes are going to be different in that day. Very different. There'll be no secrets in that day. And at that time, because that only happens at the closeness of the Lord to remember something, no one can utter a lying word before him. Nobody's going to have the ability to lie anymore. All things will be truth. Deceit will be gone. Be no need for deceit. During that time, no deceit. Right? You will change by way of your form in that. And the Lord will handle the rest. You won't have to worry about that. But, but the time before that is a time that's tricky. Right? With the attack of the Shadim, 
demons and spirits. You're talking about ancient spirits that walked the earth a long time ago. They're going to do everything they can. They're, they're doing it right now in great number, in great numbers, which means demonic, demonically influenced spirits that are all over the place are going to start assaulting people wherever they can. Things are going to turn quite spiritual. We're going to have to read that one day and pull out all the scriptures so you guys get the context for it. But will you know the difference in things? Yes, you will. You'll know the difference. But at that time, too, the Bible also says, and just like in the book of Daniel, says, when that time comes, the worst time there ever was, the dead in Christ, or, or those who are dead, those who are in the grave, will rise. Some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt. So some will be doomed and some will be saved during that time, right? During that time. You know what that means? It, that's also the time when the beast has already made himself known. So when the dead rise during that time you're talking about, so will the people who trusted in the Lord be changed. Of course you're going to know because your form is going to change too. those of you who stay the course, right? Those of you who stay the course, you'll change too. Some of those people who were dead, it says they'll rise because they're going to be judged. They're going to rise to everlasting contempt, some to everlasting life. When it comes to like, I know a lot of people think that zombies are going to walk this and the other. Let, let me explain something to you right now. There are things among us. They're just not large number. Things among us right now. There are trick. Satan is working tricks by way of these things all the time. They serve him, by the way. They're all over the place. Don't let that slow you down, regardless of what you see. These, all this alien stuff, tricksters, don't let that slow you down in your walk of faith, no matter what you see. You'll likely see a lot of them too. But I can tell you right now, all of it to me is one and the same. All of it's happening now because of the time we're in. I know what they say historically. And you know the story about the fallen ones. Do they have machines that have been found on earth? Yes, they actually do. Vimana have been found. There are Vimanas right now. People have seen, they just don't know what they saw. Things are always close to you. Always. You're, you're, if, if you're alone in your house, you're crowded all the way around right now. You don't even know it. It's not meant for our eyes to see all of that right now. It's meant for us to have a sincere walk and make some sincere choices. One day all that will lift and you will know the difference. No one will have power to lie during that time nor will they deny what they've actually been during that time. But it's the time now we have to deal with. The Lord has that time covered, but he gave us instruction for this time, and he gave us warning also. And he gave us a method by which we can function and operate and seek him. How do we receive what we need while we obey him? Hmm? These calamities that you guys see, all of them are not calamities. Some of them save souls. And they wouldn't happen anyway unless God sanctioned them to happen. And God does all things with purpose. Do you really think Satan could exist on his own? Think about Satan. People really believe that Satan somehow is walking around free doing what he wants to do. No, he does not. When it comes to you, he has to have permission. He cannot breach any hedge. God places around you. It's not going to work. But God said, Jesus says something very plainly, that you've been given power over the enemy, over all the enemy. There's nothing the enemy can do to you to overpower you. The problem is this. If you walk in disobedience, you will be overcome by the enemy because you will not exercise those powers. You will not exercise your authority over Satan if you're serving him. That is to walk in disobedience. 
You will exercise power and authority over him should you serve the living God. So it's based on your obedience. When we are disobedient, we suffer. When we are obedient, we learn, we grow. Disobedience, you have no defense against Satan because you will not utilize them. When you are obedient, you have no time for Satan and you will quickly rebuke him. Like me, I have a fly swatter. And if I'm reading the word and somebody said, Mike, look at that craft in the sky. It's like 3,000 miles long. I tell it, it, it might want to, you might want to go somewhere else. I'm reading, reading. Don't interrupt me again. Like, don't do that. See, but I wasn't always like that because I've, there have been times I saw things that just, you know, they scared the peanuts out of my M&Ms, followed by sheer wonder. That's a fact. Fully intrigued, sheer wonder, scared me to pieces, but they also intrigued me. All that passed. The Lord took me down a road that, uh, well, he just took me down a road. And if I see one now and I'm reading the word, how dare it show up when I'm in the word of God? How dare it? I will swat it or pluck it out of the land of the living by way of spiritual authority. But I won't yield to it. It won't capture my attention, nor will it make me skip a beat in the reading of what I'm doing. I do that with most situations now. They are tricky. They get you in moments you're not thinking about the Lord. They're starting to appear now because humanity is at a very weakened state. Humanity is desperately looking for someone to follow. That's why people are saying, oh, we need this leader and that leader. They're looking for another human being to follow. That's what they're looking for. Satan is taking full advantage of that. In fact, God already gave a declaration of the time we would be in when men would do this. And they're doing it. Hmm? So, you're going to know the truth given certain times. We'll have to go over this resurrection thing because there are, there are Three, is it three part, three, three things that are likened to the resurrection, but there's only, there's only one resurrection, but there are three things likened unto it. And I think they're often kind of, you know, uh, melded together a lot. So by way of a study, we'll pull them apart so that you can see all three and see why people would think that zombies would walk the earth again. Okay. Or walk the earth period. But, but to be honest with you, we need nothing. To, to things are already walking the earth, right? They're already walking on the earth. But I want you to remember something. You will see what you're ready to see. You will. You're going to see what you're ready to see, right? Now, do me a favor to remind me of what I just said, that we're going to go over that topic because uh, just remind me of that. Right, bug me about it. We'll get that study in there until you see it posted. Bug me about it so I don't skip over it. Okay, but we have some. Can you guys see we have work to do? And data points are not going to do it. We have a spiritual work to do in this earth, and God put you here for a reason. So it is important to me to make an avenue for that spiritual work. It is important for me, especially given the season we're in now, it's very important for me to make an avenue that you be heard. Now is the time when many of you need to be heard. You need to be heard. And we're going to begin that by way of, a, by way of counsel. By way of counsel. It, it always takes all you guys learning each other, right? Truly loving each other. You know those, you know how, you know what keeps people separated is when somebody does something that gets on your nerves and you never tell them. That's no good. It's just no good. What you do is you bring that out in the open. Not so one side can yield to the other, but so both halves can get rid of whatever it is that's dividing them. But if you sweep that under the rug, it's always going to be there. And it stops the cohesion everybody can have. It really does.
I hope you guys, uh, hope you guys get this. I know I was all over the place tonight. I know I was. I know I was. Somehow, hope you guys get half of at least half of it, because the Lord put things in us collectively that the world needs. Now the world is, the world is like a baby. They're claiming they know what they're doing, but in truth, they don't know what they're doing. They're reaching and searching, trying to find meaning. And frankly, it's pretty, it's kind of sad to look at, right? Now is the time for you guys to stand up spiritually. It really is. It's time for you to get up spiritually. And it is, it is part of my responsibility to make sure that what the Lord has given you, I never take for granted. It has to be put to use. People need that. People need the collective message in the body. No more division, but the collective message in the body. People need that. You really need that. So I fully intend to facilitate that. I really do. I just ask of you guys to get to know each other and to be honest about what the Lord gave you. That would be effective. Things are, you know, things are coming, yes. They're coming, things have formed. Many clocks have begun to count backward already. Meaning it's only a matter of time before large death tolls take place. But we also have babies in the earth just been born. So the mission continues. But we all know we're close, don't we? So we can't let the devil win now, right? Most people are getting up to this point. They're getting, they're, they're withdrawing from people. No need for that. All these little groups and cliques and this and the other, no need for those either. It would be a beautiful thing to be open with your brothers and sisters in Christ. The relationships you begin here will continue into eternity. Not everybody will continue like that. But there will be some that are forged here that will continue in eternity. But if we make all of our work about the Lord, if we can see the importance of his gospel and actually agree with his gospel, then we can reason together regarding that. Hmm? Most certainly we can. Somebody says, somebody said, uh, let's see, let me go back. In words of South America, well, can you mention yesterday? Yes, listen, guys, when it comes to geology, weather patterns, geology, and all these things, those come from simulations and data points, unless I state it otherwise. There's a volcano we're watching by way of data. It is cutting up, and the pressure is extremely high underneath the Earth. It's in South America. I don't want to give a location because that, that would not be wise. But it's building up. And if it continues to build up like this, it's going to blow. When it builds up like this, I'm, we're talking about a major eruption, which could loosen the Coast Coast Plate, which point, at that point, we would have to discuss California big time. Right? Eventually, I believe that's going to happen, but right now it's building up beyond, I've never seen pressure, that, that pressure build up that high. I've not seen it. So something is going to take place. Something is. And again, this is, this is based off data. Uh, which can give way to other things that have been seen spiritually, but that's based off data. Okay, there's a and, and there's a difference between um, what the Lord gives by way of a dream or a vision, and then data modeling, simulations, or or observations. There's a difference between that. Personally, I trust what the Lord gives over all the other stuff. I really do. So, and I know I had to do a better job of clarifying which one is which, right? But um, this is by data and the pressure's building and it, it, it tends to give, it tends to give a, um, you know, it's, uh, the results of that data could be very unsettling. So it's being watched. It's being watched at any rate. I'll certainly update you guys. Okay. Now it could blow without me, you know, who knows what that thing will do, but it's building up massive amounts of pressure. I've not seen it that high. And so it's being watched. And the purpose of me watching is because of California and the Coast Coast Plate, those who dwell in Peru, right? So I'm watching, I'm watching as best I can. 
But uh, it is based off data points. I'll do a better job of making that distinction between the two, though, because you guys need to know that, too. Everything I say is not uh, data points, and everything I say is not spiritually uh, derived. Not everything. Some things are just data points. But some things, as you know, I have no choice but to no choice but to say it that one way, right? Because it was spiritually given. But we'll get those things clarified. Folks, I hope you understand your importance and what's about to happen here. Listen, and, and we're all about to meet in person, right? So it's a good time, a good season to really get to know each other so that everybody's not sitting around uh, looking at each other weird when we're all in one place. Get to know each other. Get to know each other. Right? Trying to see each other as true family. I know it's difficult for some of you because of betrayals. Right? But trying to see each other as true families. And like any big family, expect to have certain issues. We'll always have those. But trying to see each other as family. Be respectful of one another. But remember, your this relationship that's formed here, for many of you, it will continue in eternity. Also understand the gravity of those things that are coming. I didn't so much go into constant depth in that as I did the cohesion that we require as we go forward. And thank God for you guys, and I hope that you thank God for each other. I really do. Now, tomorrow, I'll be back. I'm going to debate whether or not to put this video on YouTube. You know, I've never put a video on YouTube. So, uh, I don't even know the process. That's funny, isn't it? But, but we'll see. We'll see. If I put that video up there, it's going to be on the homepage first. It'll also be a link to it. Okay. If, if it goes up there, I'm debating. I'm debating. It is going to be one of the first. So I don't know if I want that one to be the first one or not. I don't know what the, that, that's my thing I'm doing there. Right. Um, so you guys have a better, better clarity on some of the events that are coming. This video gives, uh, Detail, lots of details on the ins and outs of uh, some of the things we face. But we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. But you guys will hear from me tomorrow regardless. Okay? With that, I'm going to say God bless each and every one of you. I hope you guys place on a consideration all we talked about tonight, especially for each other. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll talk again tomorrow. God bless each of you. I'll see you guys tomorrow right here. At COT, I'll put the time on the website. I'll publish that sometime tonight. God bless each of you. I'll see you guys next time.